Somebody asked me this morning as they were coming in the building, actually many people asked, uh, you know, that, that proverbial statement that is so accepted in society. You know what that statement is? How are you doing? How are you today? And I said, fine. In fact, I'm better than fine. Up until that moment in time, it had been an absolutely perfect day. What a beautiful Sunday. Great start to the day. Looking forward to bringing the word to you all. Um, contrary to what Pastor Ben said, there will not be any yelling today. Not intentionally anyway. No, no yelling, no harsh words today as part of the sermon. I know. Oh, that's terrible. Well, as I've been communicating the last several weeks, uh, today is the last in a little mini three-part series on the age of the kings. And you'll remember that two weeks ago, we talked about King Saul and one of his defining characteristics, the pride of King Saul. Our primary point that week was every time that we place ourselves above God, help me out here, every time we place ourselves above God, we lose. We're big losers when we do that. Last week, we talked about the humility of King David. And our primary point was that every time we place ourselves below God, we are blessed. Today, we're going to tie things up with this message about the heart of worship. Our primary point today is that worship is the ultimate expression of humility. Let me repeat that. Worship is the ultimate expression of humility. Now, it's important that we define a few terms as we as we get started today. I know that we uh, have, a, a, I think, probably a good understanding of what humility is, and we probably have a good understanding of what worship is. But at the same time, both of those words can mean different things to different people. And so I want us to have a shared working definition of what we're describing today. So let's begin with humility. This is right out of dictionary.com. Humility is the modest opinion or estimate of one's own importance, subcategory, or of one's own rank. We're going we're gonna to focus on that word rank here in just a minute. Humility also is the absence of being proud or being arrogant. Now, one of the things I want to point out here that's important when we talk about humility is that humility describes us where we really are, not too high and not too low either. There can be, um, you've seen this, maybe you've been uh, somebody who has displayed this from time to time, as I probably have. There can be a false sense of humility where we kind of say something like, well, oh, shucks, I don't really, I'm not hardly any good at anything, and, and uh, I don't know, I don't really have much value. Those are lies, right? Those are lies. We all have value, we all have worth, we all have things that we are good at, and it's okay to acknowledge those things. It's not immodest to talk about those things because, as we reviewed in the last couple of weeks, those are gifts from God. God gave us those things that we're good at. God gave us our talents and our abilities, and when we were spiritually reborn in Christ, we are blessed with new spiritual abilities as well. So we don't need to pretend that we are lower than we are. But at the same time, of course, what we think of most often when we think of humility is that we don't want to inflate ourselves either. We don't want to put ourselves somewhere up here when we're really somewhere in here. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the key for our purpose today is to talk about that word rank. Humility is a modest opinion or estimate of one's own importance or rank. And the key question there is, where do we rank? We've answered that question the last two weeks. We rank below God. That is the bottom line. We rank below God. And that's how we need to define humility as it relates to God. We have to ask ourselves the question, do we place ourselves above God or do we place ourselves below God, but below him? Will we place ourselves under God's care and his commandments and his counsel and his concern and his compassion? And will we ultimately place ourselves under 
the sanctifying work of Jesus Christ. If we are above God in any of these ways, we are not where we need to be. That is a biblical definition of humility. Now let's talk about worship. Worship is the object of adoring. Fervent and devoted love is the definition of adoring. The object of adoring, reverence, a feeling of deep respect tinged with awe. I know that's a lot there because I've got all these parentheses. So let's talk about what we're describing here. Our worship is the object that leads to honoring, glorifying, and idolizing. If you look up the dictionary definition, the, the first line of that is talking about God, the worship of a deity. And of course, that is the kind of worship that we want to be engaged in, the worship of our Heavenly Father and His Son and the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. But more broadly speaking, worship isn't talking just about God. Worship is talking about anything that we adore, anything that we have a fervent and devoted love towards. And the question that we have to ask ourselves as it relates to worship is, is there anything that competes for our reverence? Is there anything that competes for our fervent and devoted love? Is there anything that I have a deep respect for that is tinged with awe? I really like that description, tinged with awe. There are a lot of things in our world that we look at that are tinged with awe. Let me describe just one that is really close to home. I don't know. Anybody here heard of a 22-year-old gal named Caitlin Clark? I even hesitate to say this because it goes on YouTube. People can search, and I'm going to be associated with Caitlin Clark. So, Caitlin, I apologize if you ever see this. I do not wish to diminish the skill, the ability, the work ethic of Caitlin Clark. Those of us who have watched the Iowa women's basketball team over the winter months and into the spring, um, we have been amazed by uh, what this young woman has been able to accomplish on the basketball court. Dare I say that if you watched her on TV or you ventured down to Iowa City and you sat in Carver Hawkeye Arena, Dare I say that you might have been in awe that this young gal can stand 30 feet out from the basket and pop it in like it's nothing. I have told Michelle several times over the course of the last basketball season, and this is, this is true, uh, at 54 years old and, and a shoulder that's gone through a lot of abuse over the years, I can't even throw a basketball 30 feet, let alone actually properly shoot it with good form. Now, the best basketball player that I'm aware of, just aware of, so you, 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 you might be a stud out there to Ben's point, but the best in the room that I'm aware of is this guy right here. Double D, Derek Dorman. And Derek, I'll bet that you can, I'll bet you could shoot from 30 feet. Yes? Yeah. yeah Derek's like, yeah, you better believe I can. <laughs> you should have seen the look on his face. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've seen Derek play. He can legitimately shoot a ball from 30 feet. And, I, and years ago, when we had a, a men's kind of pickup Saturday morning, I remember watching Derek play basketball and almost being in awe of what Derek had the energy and the ability to do. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here. It's not unusual that we look at other people. It's not unusual that we look at the things around us and we do have a sense of awe about what we're seeing because it's, it's, it is awesome. It's to be recognized. Here's the challenge, right, as it relates to our worship. Does our worship ever lead to honoring or glorifying or idolizing that thing in a way that places it above God? Because at that point in time, that's where we run into trouble. At that point in time, that's where we are, are no longer setting ourselves and the things that we call important below God. So, how do humility and worship intersect with each other? I want to look at a specific example from Scripture of this. 
And by the way, uh, almost all of the verses that we're going to look at today, of course, are from our chronological Bible reading. They go backwards about two weeks and ahead about one week. And so if you're in that section of reading, you know that we've primarily passed now into uh, Chronicles. And we're starting to get into some Psalms as well, those that are associated with the events that are happening in 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles. So this is one of those exception verses. This is from 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verses 5 through 6. The apostle writes to us, All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We've talked about this verse in previous weeks. A version of God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble appears three times in Scripture. Once in the Old Testament in Proverbs, twice in the New Testament in 1 Peter and James. Peter goes on to write in the next verse, verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. There's a few key words here that I've highlighted in yellow. The first is the word humble. And in the original Greek language, that word means to make low. Okay, that fits our definition of humility. Not too high. Where do we place ourselves? We place ourselves below God. So that word humility in the Greek, to make low. The second key phrase is the word mighty. Peter writes about the mighty hand of God. In the original Greek, the word mighty, the word kratos. And that word means dominion or power or strength. Okay, so who has dominion and power and strength? Of course, God does. And so when we are humble, when we display humility, when we lower ourselves below God, where are we placing ourselves? Under the mighty hand of God. That's the intersection of where humility and worship align. We are humble and we can see a God that ought to be worshiped. In fact, that demands to be worshiped. Peter then continues that this God, when we place ourselves under his mighty hand, he will do what? He will exalt us at the proper time. That word exalt, again in the original Greek, is a word that means to lift back up or to raise up. So you see what's happening here? As we come to God in humility, As we come to God worshiping him, we are lowering ourselves under his hand, and then what does he do? He raises us right back up at a time that is appropriate. Now, we have this to look forward to. The time when we will be most exalted is going to be at the end of our lives. When we get to meet our Savior face to face, when we are in the presence of Almighty God all of the time. I don't know how that's exactly going to work. I don't know what it's going to feel like or sound like. We have a few glimpses in Scripture of that. But that will be an awesome experience, of course. That's when we will be most exalted. But even in this lifetime, God exalts us through His grace. And so, again, as we look at this relationship between humility and worship... And we examine what does it mean to have the heart of worship. Just want to have you keep that in your mind. Humility means I'm lowering myself so that I can properly worship. When I do that, God will, in his time, exalt me. I want to finally note here about worship that it is not about the action. It is about the object. There are many ways that we can worship. We've experienced a few of those here this morning. We can worship through music, and part of music is lyrics and poetry. We can worship through prayer. We'll have a prayer service coming up at the end of May over Memorial Day weekend. That will be a worship to our Father. We can worship through our giving. We experienced that this morning, bringing our tithes and offerings. We can worship by exalting God through the use of our time and giving him the best of our time. Those are all forms of worship that we see in Scripture and we can experience in our own life. And all of those are awesome. 
And the Bible doesn't limit us to worshiping in any one of those ways because it is not so much about the action as it is about the object. Who are we worshiping? That's what's most important. And that's what David is going to give us four specific examples of this morning. Different ways that he was worshiping the object of his heavenly father. You see these outlined in your bulletin. Let's look at the first one here together. The first of these ways that David shows an expression of worship from these readings over the last couple of weeks is that humble worship seeks to praise. In 2 Samuel chapter 22, we see one of many, many examples of David praising the father. David writes this, David sang this song to the Lord on the day the Lord rescued him from all his enemies and from Saul. We know from our previous reading, this could have been many days. <laughs> David had a lot of enemies, particularly prior to becoming the king of the nation of Israel. Remember, he's out leading Saul's army. The nation of Israel has many enemies as they've come in and conquered these different peoples, these different uh, city-states. David also now has the enemy of King Saul. We've read in recent weeks that at least three times King Saul tried to kill King David. And then King Saul enlists everybody around him, including his son Jonathan, to kill King David, who is not yet king. And so David sang this song to the Lord on the day the Lord rescued him from all his enemies and from Saul. He sang, my God is my rock, my fortress and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. He is my refuge, my savior, the one who saves me from violence. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise, and he saved me from my enemies. Note the different examples that David gives here of the ways that he wants to praise God. David is very specific. He acknowledges that the Lord is his rock, his fortress, his savior, his protector, his shield, that the Lord is the power that saves David. The Lord is a place of safety, a refuge for David. And he concludes here by saying that it is God who will give me life. In all of these ways, we see that David seeks praise as his primary form of worship. It would be premature to go through the 80-some psalms that are also on this very topic of praise because they haven't come up in our chronological reading. They're right around the corner, and I know many of you will enjoy that. Why do we enjoy the book of Psalms so much? In part, because we relate to what David's going through. We are not chased by King Saul. We are not chased very often by our physical enemies. Maybe, uh, maybe Seth and Eli will be chasing some of you men here in a couple of weeks. But other than that, we don't face that kind of persecution like David did. But don't you from time to time feel chased by an enemy? Don't you from time to time know that you're being pursued? Scripture tells us that we are. What do New Testament writers remind us about concerning Satan? That he's a prowling, roaring lion, scouring the face of the earth, looking to devour you and me. So we're not all that much different from David. We can't put maybe a, a physical face and a physical name to that that is pursuing us, but we are being pursued. And David, as he's being pursued, takes time to offer praise to his father that will provide all of these characteristics of what it will mean for David to be protected. So, humble worship, first of all, seeks to praise. Secondly, humble worship seeks justice. It might sound kind of odd, but... Humble worship does seek justice. And we're going to look at two examples of that in the same verse. This comes from Psalm chapter 7. 
In this psalm, we're going to encounter a guy named Cush. Now, we don't really know exactly what's going on between David and Cush. Uh, we don't have a lot of description about who Cush is. Unfortunately, that's not documented for us. But at least 32 of the 150 psalms we have in the Old Testament talk about justice. So we're reading here what is a common plea from David and others that wrote the Psalms. So from Psalm 7, verses 3 through 6, we read this. A Psalm of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning Cush of the tribe of Benjamin. O Lord, my God, if I have done wrong or am guilty of injustice, sorry about the typo, of injustice, if I have betrayed a friend or plundered my enemy without cause, then let my enemies capture me. Let them trample me into the ground and drag my honor in the dust. Now, David switches gears. Arise, O Lord, in anger. Stand up against the fury of my enemies. Wake up, my God, and bring justice. You see, David's actually talking about two different forms of justice in these few verses. The first is justice that David knows ought to be brought on him if he has done something that has displeased the Lord. What does he say? If I have done wrong, Lord, if I have done wrong, if I am guilty, if I have betrayed, if I have plundered, and I have done so without cause, David says, I am guilty. God, let my enemies capture me. That would be appropriate justice. Let me ask you, have you ever sought God's justice in your own life? Like, God, I'm guilty. Just go ahead and smite me. Probably not. I don't think that we would bring that on ourselves, right? So it's interesting to me that that's exactly what David is describing. God, if I am guilty, you are a just God. You demand righteousness. If I am guilty, take me out. That's what David is encouraging here. But of course, uh, as we read later in the psalm, the truth is that David doesn't believe that he is guilty. In this particular example, in his dealings with this man, David doesn't believe he's guilty. And so David switches then to the second form of justice. Arise, O Lord, in anger. Stand up against the fury of my enemies. Wake up, God. Wake up and bring justice. Not on David now, but on others who have wronged David. Justice is what is right. And as we looked at in previous weeks, from the example of Saul and the example of David, what is right, bottom line, is what God says. What is right is what God says. We can look at the Bible today, and we can see all kinds of things in Scripture that we probably would do differently. This past week, huge, huge, huge headline in the American church. Did you guys catch it? United Methodist Church, what remains of the United Methodist Church, formally changed its bylaws, now accepting of homosexual and lesbian men and women as pastors and endorsing homosexual marriage in the bylaws of the Methodist Church. This has been coming for a while, and now it's official. In our culture today, we have all heard, we have all seen, and we all might even emotionally respond to the idea that love is love. Love sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? Even Christ says, love your neighbor as yourself. Who gets to define love? Not us. It's God that gets to define love. It's God that gets to define gender. It's God that gets to define marriage. Might we do it differently? Perhaps. We don't have that right. It's God's right to define what is correct, 
what is righteous, what is just. And so humble worship will always seek justice from God's point of view. Whether it's justice in our own lives or justice in others. Because when we seek justice in humility, we're placing ourselves under the commandments and judgment of God. And that's exactly where we need to be, under the commandments and judgment of God. Humble worship also speaks of thanksgiving. This might be the one that we enjoy the most. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, we see what is an absolute amazing story about the beginning of the building of the temple. You'll remember that King David wants to build a temple for the Lord, a place now where God can permanently dwell. The nation of Israel has been moving about till they entered the promised land. They've got the tent of meeting that they go to to worship. Um, it's intended to be a tent that can be pulled up and moved. And we saw in our previous readings, particularly in the book of Exodus, how that tent is moved around. And uh, when God appeared, the nation of Israel moved. And they camped for a while, and they went to the tent to worship. And so David now says, hey, we've got a permanent spot of land here that's been promised to us. I want to build a temple. God says, David, you're not going to be the one that builds it. It's going to be your son Solomon. But David oversees the fundraising. And here's an example of the fundraising. From 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 13 through 15. Then David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly. O oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I? And who are my people? that we could give anything to you. Everything we have has come from you. And we give you only what you first gave us. We are here for only a moment. Visitors and strangers in the land as our ancestors were before us. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow, gone so soon without a trace. Just prior to David providing thanksgiving to the Lord, David himself had donated 112 tons of gold and 262 tons of silver and then collected from the nation of Israel another 188 tons of gold, 10,000 gold coins, 375 tons of silver, 675 tons of bronze, and 3,750 tons of iron. I don't, I don't even know what that means. That's a big number. Scripture tells us that they also contributed numerous precious stones. And that the people, as they brought all of this forward, rejoiced over the offering that they were able to make. Because, Scripture says, they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. And David was filled with joy. The people had given freely and David was filled with joy after the giving of a total of 300 tons of gold. I'm not a math guy. Some of you in the room, you're math people, but I do know how to use a calculator. And I can take my shoes off if I need backup, okay? So here is what that means in practical numbers today, okay? 16 ounces of gold in a pound, right? Okay, how many pounds in a ton? Anybody know? 2,000. So we're talking about 3,200 ounces per ton times 300 tons. At $2,000 an ounce, kind of the going rate, $1.9 billion of wealth collected for the building of the temple. That's just the gold. That's not the silver and the iron and all the other stuff. Two billion dollars of wealth that the people gave freely to an extent that David was pleased. And it is in that context that David offers this psalm of thanksgiving. What I find remarkable about this is that as the people are giving 
David also recognizes the lowness of their position. What does David say? Who am I? Who are we? Well, they're the people that just gave $2 billion worth of wealth. That's who they are. But David says, we're nothing. We really have nothing. Everything we have comes from you, God. We give only what you first gave us. And then David says, he reminds us how short our life really is, how inconsequential and insignificant in some ways we really are. We're here only for a moment. We're just visitors. We're just strangers in this land, just like the ancestors that came before us. Isn't that true of us? We're only here for a short time, just like our moms and dads and our grandparents and great-grandparents and the generations that came before us. A minuscule amount of time. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow gone so soon without a trace. Just one of the many examples that David provides of how our worship and our humility often will take the form of thanksgiving. Again, our primary point today is that worship is the ultimate expression of our humility. Finally, we see that worship is a humble worship that sometimes takes the form of desperation. This one isn't so much fun to think about. Praise and thanksgiving, that's fun. Desperation, not so fun. But we see many examples of David's desperation. The first is from Psalm 3. This is a psalm of David regarding the time that David fled from his son Absalom. Sam probably hates it when I use him as an example, but I'm going to use Sam as an example today. Now, I'm not going to use Michelle or myself as an example, just Sam. And here's why. In this paragraph, in this paragraph of Scripture that defines, that tells us, excuse me, where Absalom comes from, we also see in just a couple of verses that David had five other sons that came from five other women, so Absalom is son number six from wife or neighbor woman that David sleeps with. That's why I'm not using Michelle and I as the example here, okay? Okay, son number six. David's got many more sons that we'll read about in Scripture as well. David's family is royally screwed up. I was talking to somebody uh, within the last couple of weeks just after uh, one of the teachings, and we we're, we're talking about how the fact that that David and then his son Solomon, David, a man after God's own heart, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, had thousands, thousands of sexual partners. And God says almost nothing about it. I challenge you to look. God says almost nothing about it. But from a practical point of view, let me talk to the men here for a minute. The married men. Guys, don't we have trouble enough just keeping up with one? Seriously, can you you imagine? Now, don't imagine too far, okay? (laughs) David had more than a thousand women who were wives or concubines or sexual partners of him. Absalom is just one of these six that happen to be described. And so, Absalom... His mother was Maka. She's the daughter of Talmai, who is the king of Geshur. Now, why why do we care about any of that? Well, remember, whenever the nation of Israel went into a place, what did the Lord almost always command? Wipe them out. Cut them off. Why did God command that? Because he didn't want this to happen. That's why God commanded it. God was looking out for his people, and yet... Uh, So often, the nation of Israel rebelled against this commandment of God. They did not put themselves under God's commandment. They invented their own way of doing things. Here is the ramification. Absalom and David had a relationship that ran really hot and really cold. I'm not describing Sam yet, okay? 
a relationship that ran really hot and really cold. There are times where they're buddies, but then there's times where they are enemies. And this is an example in Psalm 3. At this point in time, Absalom has decided to gather around himself some men who serve as his army, and now Absalom is chasing down his father, King David, trying to take over the throne. Here's where we get to Sam. Imagine for a moment that my son, my only son, were chasing me down and trying to take everything that was of value to me. Dads, if that were to describe your relationship with your son, how would that feel? Can you imagine much else in this world that would feel worse? I am looking at, I'm looking at some dads here. I see Ray over here, son Miles. I'm looking at Fred, son Nathan. Look out, Fred. He's right next to you. <laughs> Got Ed and his son sitting next to him, Owen. Imagine dads. If your son is chasing you down, how would that feel? Well, we see how it feels. David tells us. O oh Lord, David writes, I have so many enemies, so many are against me. So many are saying, God will never rescue him. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory. The one who holds my head high. I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his mountain. I lay down and slept, yet I woke in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. You notice that David describes here in Psalm 3 that he needed to be rescued. And what did he do? He cried out to the Lord. This is not a psalm or prayer or words of thanksgiving. This is a desperate cry. David says, I lay down and slept, and yet I woke up in safety. Dads, imagine again your son's chasing you all over creation. You'd be tired. You might be afraid to lay down and fall asleep. David says, I lay down, I slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. David is desperate. In Psalm 63, we see another example. God, you are my God. Earnestly, I search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. You are my helper. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. Desperate. David is desperate. Aren't you and I desperate from time to time? Things aren't going well. Something's chasing after us. A bad habit, a bad circumstance, a bad job, a bad day, something's chasing. It's okay. It's okay to go to the Lord in desperation. It's okay to cry out to the Lord. Not everything has to be rosy between you and God. You can pull a David. You can cry to the Lord and ask him to rescue you. I so appreciate that David gives us these examples. Because humble worship not only seeks to praise and not only speaks of thanksgiving, two things that sound wonderful, but humble worship also seeks justice. Humble worship also is desperate. Worship is the ultimate expression of our humility. Humility in many forms. Back in 1999, a song that has become really, really popular in the church was written by a man named Matt Redman. The lyrics of the song go like this, when the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way that things appear, you look into my heart. God is not interested in the way things appear. God's interest is in your heart, 
my heart. And the question that God is asking each of us today, the question that we've asked of ourselves the last several weeks is this. Do I have a heart of arrogance? Do I have a heart of pride? Or do I have a heart of humility? Am I placing myself below God or above God? As we sing this closing song, I invite you to continue to ask yourself that question. And if this song today needs to be a song of repentance for you, let it be a song of repentance and ask God to reveal your own heart to you, your own position to you, and have this be a day where you humble yourself before the Lord. Remember, those who humble themselves before the Lord will be lifted up. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's sing this song together. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come Longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. of endless worth no one could express how much you deserve though I'm weak and poor all I have is yours every single breath I'll bring you more than a song a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. Oh, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, oh, it's all about you. It's all about you. Oh, it's all about you. Oh, it's all about you. It's all about you.
You remind us, Father, that those who wait upon the Lord have, will have their strength renewed, that we will mount up on wings like eagles, that we will run and not grow weary, that we will walk and never faint. Lord, I pray that blessing for myself and for my friends here this morning. Allow us, Lord, give us the strength to be humble. Give us reminders that when we are under you, you will bless. Give us this week what we desire, your blessing as we serve you, as we love you, and as we love those around us. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you all this week. Please join us for lunch and have a great rest of your week.